Welcome to another Datasheet Deep Dive. This time, it's time to get your latest smartphones out and put your glasses on because we're talking tech with this new Primaris Tech Marine data sheet from the 9th edition Space Marine book. What's up, folks? Welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name, as always, is Trevi, and today we are doing another data sheet deep dive into probably one of the coolest data sheets co to come out of the new 9th edition book. This is the Primaris Tech Marine. And when I saw this model spoiled, I was worried that it would just be a normal Tech Marine, but he'd have plus one attack and plus one wounds, like most of the other Primaris versions of other character types. But this Primaris Tech Marine is, oh boy, is he, uh, he's his own beast and I am so excited to talk about him. Today we're going to be talking about a general overview of the Primaris Tech Marine, some of the best places in a Space Marine list to use this unit, some of the specific vehicles and synergies that you can use along with him, and we're going to talk about an interesting archetype that you can build around this particular type of unit before giving it our final verdict. Before we get into the video, just a real quick reminder that if you like the content and if you like these data sheet deep dives, go ahead and hit the subscribe button beneath the video. Also, let me know that this is the type of content that you like to watch by dropping a like down there and or a comment. That really helps tell me whether or not these videos are popular and people like them and encourages me to do more of them. Anyway, let's get down to it and talk about the newest Tech Marine profile for Space Marines. So the Primaris Tech Marine is the poster child for the new paradigm of Tech Marines in Space Space Marine lists. And that is with, I'm, I'm just going to come out, we're going to talk about it right now, this Awaken the Machine Spirits ability that this Tech Marine has. Now, previously, Tech Marines were pretty good because generally they had a, a pretty good swath of weapons. They did, you know, reasonable damage in shooting, and they could repair your vehicles, which, very, which was very nice. They were also a relatively cheap HQ option, so you could squeeze them into lists pretty easily. But now, they have an extra ability on top of what they were bringing before, and it sort of harkens back to the Master of the Forge upgrade that you could take on them in 8th edition, which allowed them to take the Forge Master Warlord trait, which gave them a 6-inch aura of plus 1 to hit for all vehicles. Now, obviously, that was really broken, and I'm glad that it's been removed because that, that is too big a blanket aura to uh, be able to give out to everything. But it's been replaced by this universal ability that all Tech Marines have now called Awaken the Machine Spirits. This lets you, in your command phase, pick one chapter vehicle within 3 inches. They get plus 1 to hit with their guns. Sick. We did talk about this when we were covering the Gladiators in the last video that I did. This buff is a really big deal, especially for non-Dreadnought vehicles. Dreadnoughts have the core keyword, so they get access to rerolls just like a normal infantry squad would. But the big tanks and stuff have nothing like that. So the Tech Marines are in here to help those guys out. Now, on the flip side, Tech Marines can also just buff Dreadnoughts with that too. So you can get the best of both worlds if you're taking a Dreadnought. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but... This Primaris Tech Marine is one of the most efficient delivery systems for this rule that you can get in the Codex. Now, obviously, the standard Tech Marine has it as well, but for just 10 more points, you get a whole bunch of really cool stuff with the Primaris Tech Marine, so let's talk about it. Looking over his stat block, we have a pretty standard Primaris stat block. Over a regular non-Primaris character, he has plus one attack and plus one to wound, so pretty reasonable combat stats. That is also aided by the fact that Tech Marines generally have some pretty solid melee weapons. Uh, this guy's comes packing automatically with an Omniscient Power Axe, which is a flat two damage, strength six weapon at minus two AP. That's nice to have. That guy's gonna chunk some people for some damage whenever you get into melee with them. He also has all of the other uh, Tech Marine goodies that we uh, we normally associate with Tech Marine melee stats. He has a servo arm, which is the equivalent profile of a Thunder Hammer now. Oh, however, it does not give you minus one to hit. The downside is that you can only make one of your attacks with this. So theoretically, if he's in the first round of combat and he's benefiting from Shock Assault, he's going to be swinging four times with his uh, two damage power axe, one time with his big flat three damage power arm. But then on top of that, he also gets two additional attacks at strength five, no AP, one damage, and that is uh, from his little mecha dent right here. Tech Marines typically play a little bit far back. They're they're there to buff your um, they're there to buff and r repair your vehicles, so they're not really frontline fighters. So a lot of times they're not going to get into the fight until around th round three or four, and at that point they're in assault doctrine. All this stuff is plus one AP. On top of that, this guy follows in the glorious Tech Marine tradition of being pretty good at shooting. He has the patented Tech Marine ballistic skill of two plus. And he's going to use that to deliver shots with, uh, most importantly, his forge bolter. It's a big bolter. He's got it mounted on his shoulder, actually. So it's kind of, it's like the Predator <laughs> laser gun, basically. 
And that's represented by the fact that he can fire it in addition to shooting his other weapons. So normally, they would only be carrying a, a pistol. This guy has uh, come stock with a graph pistol. A p the pistol rule says that you can't fire a pistol in addition to any other types of weapons that you're holding. But the forged bol bolter overrides that. So he can fire both his pistol and his bolter at the same time, get a bunch of flat two damage uh, shots going through. And that is because this forged bolter comes in at basically a heavy bolter profile. Strength five, minus one, two flat damage, three shots. In a, it's an assault weapon. Uh, it is only range 24, but typically that's going to be fine. What a cool profile. It, the, the, the fact that it's assault also means that it benefits from tactical doctrine instead of devastator doctrine. Devastator doctrine obviously only works for round one, and typically you're not going to have very good shots with your weapons in that, but you get potentially two turns of tactical doctrine if you want to stay in it for an extra round. So this thing can be AP2 for two uh, for two full turns, which is awesome. So once you get up to it, up close to this guy, he can be shooting four strength five, two flat damage, AP two and three shots at you, which is, I mean, it's not going to blow up a tank, but man, is it is it going to chunk a couple of wounds off that thing? It's going to kill some Primaris Marines. It is actually a legitimately threatening salvo of shots. In addition, he does have that Artificer armor on, so he's coming in with a two plus armor save, which is nice. He comes in uh, with the stock standard frag grenades, crack grenades. He doesn't have a bolt pistol because he's already got his graph pistol. Uh, he's a tech marine, thank goodness. So he can he can actually be upgraded to a master of the forge, unlike the Primaris apothecary who cannot be upgraded to a chief apothecary for whatever reason. He also has the Primaris keyword. Uh, now that's not too surprising, but it is important because it does unlock a couple very important stratagems. Gene rot might being one of them. He does have enough attacks that it might sometimes be useful. I don't think you, you'll typically use it on a single character like that, but the big one is transhuman physiology. So if something big gets on this guy, because he's a unit below five models, can just burn one CP and that transhuman is going to be active on him. He comes in at four power level and 80 points for this whole package, which is only 10 points more than an unupgraded normal tech marine which is, in my opinion, a bargain. You get the extra wound, you get the extra attack, you get a bunch of sweet war gear that you don't have to pay for. You get that for free. You get the sweet forge bolter. I mean, the forge bolter alone might make up for those extra 10 points. If it shoots one intercessor to death, you're already you know making bank. Uh, and I think it definitely will over the course of a game. So I think if you are taking tech marines in this army, this Primaris tech marine profile is probably the one that you want to be looking at. Like all tech marines, he also has blessings of the Omnissiah so he can repair a vehicle within three inches at the end of your movement phase for d3 wounds that can be upgraded to a flat three wounds if you upgrade him to a master of the forge but obviously like i mentioned before right at the top awaken the machine spirits is the headliner here and that is mostly what we're going to be talking about today now one thing i'd like to point out with this awaken the machine spirits is that unlike that aura that i talked about in eighth edition it does only benefit your ranged attacks so if you are running dreadnoughts with him which we're definitely going to be talking about uh, unfortunately it will not benefit their big punchy fists they're just going to have to roll that at their regular weapon skill now, as we move on to this video and we start talking about some interesting synergies to use with this tech marine, one thing that I'm going to point out right now is that this guy... He is a, he's a buffer. He's not a buffy. So instead of talking about abilities that we can use on him to make him better, we're going to talk about some of the best units in the codex for him to give that plus one to hit and that use that repair on. Now, as good as this ability is, it is tacked to a relatively expensive character, 80 points. It's not, you know, an immense amount of points, but it isn't exactly chump change. So when you're looking at a vehicle to take alongside him to buff up with that, I would be looking at the bigger stuff with more shots. Basically, anything that's like a gladiator size or bigger is what I would be prioritizing with this guy. Anything smaller than that, you're not really getting very good use out of that ability. It also works only on a single model, so he can't like take an entire unit of land speeders and buff, buff all of them up. So generally, you're going to want it to be the big chunky tanks or dreadnoughts. Now, I should mention as well that while this ability isn't cumulative with other tech marines, you can have multiple tech marines in your army and you can have other instances of the same effect. So, for example, Tor Garadon and Iron Father Fieros are both special characters for Imperial Fists and Iron Hands respectively, and both of them have a very similar ability. They both have Sigma Rays, which can give plus one to hit for any chapter unit. It doesn't have to be a vehicle at all. It doesn't even have to be core, actually. It just gives it whatever they want, plus one to hit. So you can take those alongside a Primaris Tech Marine, and you can buff up a whole swath of your army. Obviously, multiple plus one to hit abilities on the same unit don't really do much, but if you're running multiple vehicles or dreadnoughts or big units that you want to be buffing, 
having multiple instances of plus one to hit is very useful. Now, before we move forward as well, I do want to talk about the Forge Master upgrade. The first thing it does is turn the Tech Marine's Blessing of the Omnissiah to a flat three wounds repaired instead of a D3, which is very nice to have. It's not a, like a huge deal, but it is a good ability for the upgrade. But the big reason that you're going to be taking it is to unlock the Warlord trait, Warden of the Ancients, which gives any Dreadnoughts within six inches plus one strength and plus one attack. Now, I'm gonna say it right now, I don't think that plus one strength is almost ever relevant. I guess you could put a you could put Might of Heroes in a Redemptor and that would make it strength 16. So we're wounding knights on twos. All right, we did it, everyone. We figured it out. But generally, you're gonna want it for that plus one attack. That's a big deal. Some of these Dreadnought close combat weapons that we're about to talk about are immensely powerful and getting even one extra attack out of that is a big freaking deal. The Relic Axe you can equip from uh, upgrading to Master of the Forge, it makes his Power Axe Strength 7 and a flat 3 damage. The extra damage is nice, uh, it makes it sort of like a Thunder Hammer, but only getting to Strength 7 is a little disappointing. So uh, generally you don't really want to waste a Relic slot on that. I would typically leave that off of this guy. They only have a 3 plus weapon scale, so they're not the best thing to put a Relic uh, melee weapon on. So now moving on, let's talk about some of the units that we can buff with this Awaken the Machine Spirit aura. I want to start by talking about the non-Dreadnoughts, because we'll talk about Dreadnoughts in a sec. And I'm just going to preface this by saying that I'm not going to delve into Forge World stuff right now. Down that road lies madness. And the status of Forge World is sort of in question currently because there's a new Forge World book with all new data sheets coming out later this year. And I talked about it in a recent video, but like a lot of Forge World battlefield roles and stuff is messed up right now. So we don't ex exactly know where their power level s sits. Also, I mean, if you want to talk about the biggest bang for your buck, uh, just like stick this guy next to a fire raptor and hope that you don't lose on primary objectives before like the 40 multi-damage shots you're shooting every turn that hit on twos uh, wipes out your opponent's entire army. So we're just going to be focusing on codex units right now. Now, generally what you want to be doing with a lot of these plus one to hit auras is applying them to a unit that makes the most attacks. The bigger force you can force multiply with an ability like Wake Awaken the Machine Spirits, the more quickly and efficiently, you're going to make back the 80 points that you spent on that Primaris Tech Marine. So what we're going to be looking for are the biggest and heaviest hitting vehicles in the Codex. To start off, the Headliners are the Repulsor and the Repulsor Executioner. These are the first of the big sort of centerpiece vehicles that you can put into your army. They are Toughness 8, which is a big deal. That's a good cutoff point for a lot of anti-tank firepower. They have a big pool of wounds, which is good to have when you are bringing units alongside them that can repair them because it's much more difficult to one round these tanks. Now, the Repulsor and the Executioner specifically are more offensively oriented than their mini marine counterparts, the Land Raider. The Repulsor itself can be kitted out to shoot upwards of 40 times. The Executioner can also mount a big anti-tank weapon as well. And these units can put out an immense amount of firepower. The Land Raider variants are basically in line with the Repulsors. They don't shoot quite as hard, but they uh, but they do save you a, a couple points and they are a little bit harder to kill. They support a two plus armor save rather than the three plus armor save that the Repulsors do. Both of these vehicle types have 16 wounds, which like I said, is very powerful when you're trying to repair them. And both of them take defensive buffs really well. Despite the fact that they lack the core keyword and can't be buffed by a lot of the stratagems in the codex, there are still a lot of defensive buffs that you can put on these big, huge tanks. I would go back and watch the Gladiator video I just did. I talk about a lot of ways to buff the survivability of your vehicles. But they're gonna draw a ton of firepower and the goal is to make them soak as much damage as possible. You really want to stack as many defensive effects on them as you can. A lot of times they're going to have access to smokescreen, which is great, but you can compound that with invulnerable saves and, and damage ignore rolls, all sorts of stuff that you can stack on these things. The goal of which is that they don't get killed in one or two turns, and that gives you more chances to repair those three wounds on them, and of course, more shooting phases to get plus one to hit with a whole bunch of guns. So the Repulsor and Executioner are good if you want to be more offensively oriented. The Land Raider and the Crusader, I don't think I would play a Redeemer if I was looking specifically to get plus one to hit on it. It doesn't have that many attacks it has to roll for because a lot of its damage output comes from its flamethrowers. But the standard Land Raider, I'm actually kind of looking back at now. It's extremely difficult to kill and can mount almost the same damage output as a Gladiator Valiant. The Valiant fires eight strength, eight and nine shots, and you can get the standard Land Raider to fire six 
multi melta and last cannon shots at a longer range it has standard lance cannons not talons and it has two heavy bolters mounted on top of it as well giving all those plus one to hit is a pretty big deal and it will end up being around the same damage output as a valiant once all of its additional upgrades are rolled in the land reader crusader is i guess sort of roughly equivalent to like a gladiator reaper it shoots a whole bunch of times unfortunately it's just a lot of standard bolter shots i don't know how often the Crusader is going to see play. Honestly, it doesn't really seem like it fills a role to me in particular, but but shooting 36 strength four and six shots means that it does benefit from that plus one to hit pretty well. I talked a lot about the gladiators in the previous video, so I'm not really going to go over them again. They're basically one step down from the repulsors and the land raiders. They only have 12 wounds, but they're still toughness eight and their damage output is a little more focused into one role, whereas like the land raider has heavy bolters as well as las cannons, so it can engage multiple types of targets. The gladiators are going to be anti-tank or anti-infantry, one or the other. They typically make an enormous number of attacks. The Valiant shoots eight times at a really powerful anti-tank profile. The Reaper shoots 40 times at an anti-infantry profile, and both of them benefit immensely from the Tech Marine buff. The Lancer already has a plus one to hit effect on top of its gun, so it doesn't really need one. So I probably would not even bring a Tech Marine if I was just going to bring a single Lancer, but if I'm bringing any of the other gladiator variants, I would definitely take one of these guys. Along. I'm also going to mention that indirect fire is a lot is very useful to, to take if you're bringing this effect with you. Big vehicles are really scary and people tend to hide from them or stay out of their threat range and having an indirect fire platform like a whirlwind or a whirlwind scorpius i said i wasn't going to talk about forge world but whirlwind scorpius is a pretty important <laughs> pretty important model having one of those in your army to be able to poke at your opponent while the rest of your armored vehicles sort of trundle up the table and take board space makes it so they can't really hide from your gun line and it means that your primaris tech marine has something to do even if your big tanks don't have any targets in range now, of the other tank-esque vehicles in the Codex, you'll find that a lot of them are, I mean, they're a little underpowered typically, and they don't really fulfill a role where a Tech Marine's gonna be useful. One of the detriments of this Awaken the Machine Spirit's ability is that it triggers in your command phase and has to be within three inches of the Tech Marine. So if you're playing something like a Stormhawk, that is rocketing across the board and jumping around with the aircraft rules, it will basically never be in range to be affected by the Tech Marine. The same goes for a lot of the smaller and more mobile vehicles like land speeders and anything smaller than, I think I would say a gladiator, is just a little bit inefficient to put a plus one to hit effect on from a character who is already relatively expensive just by themselves. So with those vehicles taken care of, let's talk about the giant metal elephant in the room and that is Dreadnoughts. Dreadnoughts have sort of been reinvigorated by this 9th edition codex, in my opinion. In the comparison between Dreadnoughts and any other form of vehicle, Dreadnoughts have one enormous benefit, and that is in addition to Duty Eternal Baked In, which is incredibly good, but that is the core keyword. That means that any of the Dreadnought chassis that are currently in the Space Marine Codex can benefit from all of your synergies. All of your rights of battle and your tactical precision auras work on them, your chaplain litanies work on them, a lot of your stratagems like crucible of battle work on them, and that is so incredibly important. In addition, getting access to a plus one to hit aura makes those reroll ones auras even more impactful because it means that when you're rerolling ones, that reroll is more likely to convert. So you can get most of these dreadnoughts to hitting on twos, rerolling ones very easily by just putting a tech marine and a captain next to them, or just by spending a CP and have them generating their own captain aura. And that will mean that almost 100% of their attacks will convert. So generally, while dreadnoughts don't typically have the same volume of attacks that tanks have, just even looking at the gladiators, you can see that, you know, these sort of mid-level tanks will be sporting you know, an immense swath of artillery, but they make up for that with their attacks being more reliable, them working more effectively with synergies in your army, and by being harder to kill just because of that Duny Eterna rule. They also typically have a very scary melee profile. And we mentioned before in, combina in conjunction with the Warden of the Ancients, Warlord trait from the Forge Master upgrade that you can get some really, really devastating melee damage output from these things if your opponent is ever dumb enough to get close to them. 
Now, out of the Dreadnoughts in the book, I think the one that's being the most pushed right now is the Redemptor Dreadnought. This one was an absolute joke in 8th edition, but now it has been reimagined. It has that Duty Eternal built in all the time, so it's always minus one to be damaged. That's really important because it has 13 wounds, which is a lot of wounds. It's only toughness 7, so a lot of times your enemy's attacks are going to convert against it a little bit more often. But with that Dirty Eternal, it should, on the whole, take less damage from anti-tank shooting. That also means that wounds that you repair on these Dreadnoughts are going to be more valuable, and the Dreadnoughts are more often going to survive on a couple wounds with that minus 1 damage to, to be around to be repaired. Now, one of the reasons that Redemptor Dreadnoughts are great, specifically for this Tech Marine buff, is that they have a whole bunch of shots. They can all equip an Onslaught Gatlin Cannon on their Power Fist, which is like, I mean, that's a pretty good uh, <laughs> throwaway sidearm to have. They can also take two Storm Bolters apiece on top of their big giant Plasma Cannon. The Plasma Cannon has excellent damage, and because of that core keyword, if you have a Captain nearby or are generating rerolls from Wisdom of the Ancients, you can overload it pretty reliably for big damage at Strength 9 AP 3, three flat damage for each shot. It is a D6 shot weapon. It's Blast, so sometimes you'll get a little bit more reliability from Blast. And I mean, sometimes you're just going to shoot one time and you're going to feel bad about it. Sometimes you're just going to roll that six for shots and rip 18 wounds off of a tank or something, and you're going to feel real good about yourself. They also have an insane melee weapon. And compared to any of the other melee weapons on any of the other Dreadnoughts, it is just off the chain. It hits for D3 plus 3 damage, which is as much as a laser destroyer. <laughs> this guy punches as hard as a repulsor executioner shoots, and it's attacks like that that you really want to have benefiting from that Warden uh, of the Ancients ability. Honestly, I'm kind of excited to see where Dreadnought lists go in the future. We could be seeing lists with two or three Redemptor Dreadnoughts at their core being a big sort of impenetrable fire base that moves up the table, gets buffed by these Primaris Tech Marines, maybe by maybe by Iron Father Fieros. They can shrug off a ton of damage with flat three repairs. They can deal immense damage in melee once you get into them, and you can buff them to make them stupid hard to kill. I'm not gonna go through all of the buffs that you can put on them. It is an even greater swath that you can put onto tanks. Things like the Iron Hand's ability to get a six plus damage ignore, the Salamander's Obsidian and Aquila giving them a six plus damage ignore as well, Might of Heroes to get them to toughness eight, which is a big breaking point, multiple ways to get them an invulnerable save. I mean, the list goes on and on. An important part of the combination, in my opinion, is the Rights of War Warlord trait coming out of the Space Marine Codex. That will give all of them the objective secured rule, so enemy objective secured units running into your castle of dreadnoughts isn't aren't automatically going to take that objective away at that point they have to outnumber you that's something that they can still do if they you know just put a bunch of random infantry onto that objective but i mean yeah you gotta you gotta onslaught gatling cannons and all those redemptors they're not going to have too much trouble <laughs> scything through a bunch of infantry so overall i do think that dreadnought lists and vehicle specific lists potentially have a place going forward into the ninth edition metagame are they going to be great i mean to be completely honest, probably not. Uh, eradicators are super good right now. Anti-tank is very powerful in the meta, and vehicles tend to be less good at scoring objective points than more numerous unit types. But at the same time, I think it's still playable and definitely has the chance to win, and it's classy as hell. So with that, let's move on to the final verdict of the Primaris Deck Marine. Is this unit worth putting in a Space Marine Army? And the answer is unequivocally yes. <laughs> I think this profile is awesome compared to a standard Tech Marine profile for just a couple more points. He's harder to kill, he hits way harder in melee, his gun is really good, and they're going to be relatively close to the fight because they do have to be within three inches of your front line if you're making it out of vehicles. So adding a little bit of survivability for not that many points on top of a standard Tech Marine profile is a really big deal. I said it before, and I'll say it again, I think that there's a place for a Dreadnought or a vehicle-centric list out of this Space Marine Codex, and I'm excited to see somebody try it. I think I'm going to go load up some Redemptor Dreadnoughts in Tabletop Simulator right now, everybody. So that is going to be it for this data sheet deep dive, everybody. Thanks for watching. Let me know down in the comments what you think about this Primaris Tech Marine. Are you going to get one? I mean, I think it seems pretty cool. And big stompy robot boys are my jam. So I'm hoping that there's a Dreadnought list in there somewhere. I'll probably give one a go online. We'll see if it translates into the real game. But oh boy, am I uh, excited to potentially put a bunch of big Redemptors on the table and march them right up, shoot some plasma people, blow them up, and then punch them with those like laser 
or destroy your fists. That's going to be so cool. As always, big shout out to my patrons. You can see them up on the screen here. They help support me and the channel, and I definitely wouldn't be at this stage without their help, so I really appreciate each and every one of them. You can join them at patreon.com slash tactical tortoise. In addition, we do have a new membership available on YouTube. You can hit that join button down below the video if you want to join that. Both of them give you some pretty sweet benefits. If you join on YouTube, you get access to some member-only emojis and badges for your account, which is sweet. If you join on Patreon, you'll get early access to videos. You'll get some unique content. I usually put my bloopers up there in the videos and some other commentary, so you get a little bit more of that. I do exclusive videos every once in a while, and you get early access to T5S2 tournament pods and other benefits. We do some usually uh, Patreon-specific events. I think we're going to be doing one pretty soon, so stay tuned for that. So anyway, big thanks again to all my patrons, and big thanks to you for watching at the end of the video. I really appreciate it. Have a good one. Keep it classy, folks. Remember to have happy wargaming.